All right, so welcome to uh, Friday, November 6th. Um, and uh, we are going to pick up where we left off last time. We're going to keep talking about the second derivative and concavity and what that means and then put that together with um, the first derivatives and uh, stuff like that and start seeing how we get really, really accurate graphs with just some calculus. So that's the plan for today. Um, but of course, before we do that, I, I need to mention one thing about our schedule. So I messed up when I created our syllabus. I have no idea where I got this date, but uh, the college is technically celebrating or honoring Veterans Day next Wednesday. I have it in the syllabus as Monday. I don't want to change what we got going on with our syllabus at this point. I think it's just going to confuse everybody. And since we're not actually physically on campus, it doesn't matter that campus is closed. So even though the college and everything at the college website says uh, their thing is closed on Wednesday, we're going to go with what I have on my schedule. And again, I apologize for this. Um, so we're not going to have class Monday. We will have it Wednesday. So your next homework sets are actually due Wednesday night, not Monday night. All right, so they're due Wednesday night. Um, so we're going to go with what the syllabus says and what we've got set up in Canvas. So just in case there's any confusion, defer to the syllabus and Canvas. All right, you can always send me a message or something um, inquiring what's going on, but I don't want to start shuffling due dates and everything. I think that's just going to confuse the hell out of everybody. Um, so I'm just going to own my mistake, apologize for it. Um, hopefully it doesn't really actually impact anybody um if it does please let me know all right so i uh, just need to make that announcement um but now i want to turn it to you guys any questions on homework or anything we've been working on all right well hearing none and seeing none we'll go ahead and then keep marching along so i'm going to pop up to the whiteboard i'll see you guys in just one second All right, so we now have a pretty good idea of the whole increasing and decreasing thing, right? If the derivative is positive, we know that our function is increasing. If the derivative is negative, we know our function is decreasing. And so with that, we're actually able to get pretty good pictures of um, functions. And, and I showed you a couple last time, um, but then I introduced you to concavity. And concavity is going to help us even further when it comes to drawing these things. We're going to get much better shapes. So let me remind you about concavity and what they look like, what they do. So we have two types of concavity. We have concave up, and we've got concave down. So concave up, it means that the graph looks like it could be part of a cup shape. Concave down, it looks like it could be part of a frown shape. And um, again, remember the idea I told you is concave up like a cup. It's a good way to remember it. And then we're concave down like a frown. Um, but in terms of the calculus, what this is, uh, what we know from these is that concave up, this is when our second derivative is greater than zero, and concave down is when our second derivative is less than zero. I also gave you a way to think about this with the tangent lines. So let me go ahead and put that here as well. For concave up, the tangent lines are below the graph. And for concave down, the tangent lines are above the graph. And uh, I talked about skiing and snowboarding for those of you who do that activity. Um, the difference between you know, like when you're going over a hump and your board or your skis are sticking out above the terrain, as opposed to when you're in some sort of dip and your skis or snowboard are trying to dig into the snow. 
Okay, so this is concave up, concave down, and um, this is what we're going to get from the second derivative. So we're going to do some examples today where we look at concavity and figure out what the concavity is of the graph, um, and then use that in addition to the increasing or decreasing to get really good picture. All right, so we've gotten here, but I want to give you another uh, definition because these are things we're going to talk about, and these are called inflection points. So these are special points, inflection point. And an inflection point, this is a place, or I guess more, put, uh, more than a point, a point where the graph changes concavity. So I'm going to put here, uh, it changes from concave up to concave down. And then in parentheses, you're going to put, or vice versa. Meaning we could go from concave down to concave up. All right, so inflection points are any places where we change concavity. So we go from concave up to concave down, or vice versa. So what that would look like on a graph, let me show you an example of an inflection point. Um, let's just say we've got some sort of like a cubic function here, like this. The inflection point, this has one inflection point, and this inflection point would be right around there. So if you look to the left of the inflection point over here, the graph is always concave up, right? It looks like it fits on a cup. To the right of that inflection point, it's concave down. Looks like it would fit on a frown. And so that spot right there, we change concavity from concave up to concave down. Okay, so that's all an inflection. It's just a place where we change from um, change concavity. Now, it's analogous to extrema with the first derivative. Think about with first derivative. We saw last time the first derivative test that said if we change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, then we have an extreme point. Well, that's the first derivative going from plus to minus or minus to plus. Right, changing sign. Inflection points are where the second derivative goes from plus to minus or minus to plus. All right, so you can kind of see why they're important anyway, but they've got this relationship to extrema with the first derivative. So these are places where the derivative is changing the greatest the fastest change in the derivative. So the quickest change in the slope is occurring at that point. All right, so those are inflection points. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a function and we're going to look and see what are its inflection points or what's the concavity for this function? Where are the inflection points? And then um, we'll kind of couple that with increasing and decreasing. All right, so we're going to look at a function that we already looked at before. This was one we looked at last time. And we just talked about increasing and decreasing with it last time. But this time, let's find the inflection points and the concavity. So find inflection points and concavity of f of x equals um, x to the fourth minus is it 4x cubed? I think was the one we did last time. Hold on one second. Yep. All right, good. That's the one we did before. Okay, so here's the function I want to look at. So last time 
We looked at increasing and decreasing. Now let's look at concave up and concave down. All right, so this has everything to do with the second derivative. So let's find the second derivative of this function. So we already found f prime of x. We did this last time, um, but it's 4x cubed minus 12x squared. So we use that to figure out increasing and decreasing. But we're going to now take the second derivative which is 12x squared minus 24x. And we're going to look at where is that thing greater than 0, where is that less than 0, because that will tell us concave up and concave down. And then any point at which we switch from concave up to concave down is an inflection point. All right, so we're going to do exactly what we did last time. We're going to look at this 12x squared minus 24x, and we're going to see where is it bigger than 0. So let's start with concave up. That's going to be 12x squared minus 24x is greater than 0. So if we treat this like an equation so we can cut the real number line up, uh, if we factor out a 12x, we get 12x times x minus 2. So that tells us that we need to take the real number line, and we need to cut it at 0 and 2, because those are the only places where we might change concavity. All right, so now let's test the intervals. Let's look at what we get with our second derivative when we're in these various places. So for example, plug in some number bigger than 2. Uh, actually, let's go in the middle. Let's plug in 1, and let's see what happens when we plug in 1. So f double prime of 1, we come here to the derivative, the second derivative. It's going to be 12 minus 24, which is negative 12. So since that's a negative number, I know I'm going to get a negative everywhere between 0 and 2. The negative second derivative tells me it's concave down. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a little frown shape above this. And that's my way of remembering, OK, it's concave down in that interval. All right, so what about a number bigger than 2? Well, pick your favorite number bigger than 2. Uh, plug in 10. Plug in a million. Yeah, no, you'd probably plug in three, whichever. Right? Um, but when we plug a number bigger than two in, we're going to get a positive number. And let me show you how I do this. I don't actually plug numbers in. I think I hinted at this when we did derivatives. I look at this factored form, and I just look at the signs of all these different pieces. The 12 is always positive. If x is bigger than two, then x is positive. So I've got positive times a positive. If x is bigger than 2, then x minus 2 is also positive. So I have positive times positive times positive, which is a positive number. So I know that the second derivative over here is positive. So that's going to be concave up. Now, if you don't like that, if that whole whoa, positive, positive, positive thing kind of went over your head. That's fine. Don't do that. Just plug in a number bigger than 2 and see what that number is. I'm just too lazy to actually do the calculation. All right, so in this interval, second derivative is positive, so it's concave up. So already I know that there's an inflection point. And there's going to be an inflection point when x is equal to 2 because I'm changing concavity. I'm going from concave down to concave up. All right, so we still have to figure out if 0 is an inflection point. So we got to check a number less than 0. OK, well, if you plug in a number less than 0, 12 is positive. x is now negative. x minus 2 is going to be negative. 
So a plus times a minus times a minus is a plus. So down here, this is going to be concave up. Again, if you don't like that, plug in a number smaller than zero, like negative one. Put that into the second derivative. You're going to see you get 12 plus 24, which is 36. Positive number concave up. All right, so we now know the concavity, right? I said find the inflection points and the concavity of this thing. Well, I know that it's concave up on the interval minus infinity to zero and also the interval two to infinity. And there were two intervals where we were concave up. And then I know that it's concave down when we're between zero and two. So there's the answer to what's the concavity. But then I also said find inflection points. So we already saw that two is going to lead to an inflection point. What about zero? Is zero an inflection point? So Bailey just gave me a thumbs up. It absolutely is an inflection point because again, we changed concavity. We went from concave up to concave down. All right, so inflection points, it doesn't matter which way we're changing concavity, just that we're changing. All right, so there's our concavity. Uh, so here are inflection points. We've got inflection points. One of them is zero, zero. When x is zero, I get a y of zero. So zero, zero is an inflection point. And then when I plug in two, I get 16 minus 32, which is minus 16. So that's my other inflection point. OK, so at this point, sometimes students ask me, well, do we have to find the y for those? And my answer is yes. If we're going to talk about an inflection point, points need an x and a y coordinate. So what we found were the x's when we did this whole cut the real number line and check. But if you want the points, you need their y's as well. OK, so this has two inflection points. Now, I don't know if you remember what the graph of this thing looked like, but it looks something like this. Maybe you kind of remember. Um, you can always plot it on Desmos or your graphing calculator or whatever. But you can see these inflection points. There are two inflection points here. If you look to the left of this guy, this is the zero. If you look left of that, it's concave up. It's on a cup. Then it turns into concave down. Once we reach the second point, notice it turns to concave up. So you can actually visually see where inflection points need to be. And um, the graph, definitely confirms what our calculus showed us. All right, so how are we feeling about concavity and inflection points? Okay, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up, which I like. All right, so if you're good with extrema and increasing and decreasing, you should be good with concavity because it's the same process. It's just we need one more derivative. Graphically, it tells us something different, but we can still spot it graphically. I have a quick question. Yeah, go for it, Alia. Um, I was just slightly confused um, kind of early on when you factored out 12x times x minus 2 is greater than 0. Could you uh -huh. have just set that equal to 0 and then found the zeros. I guess I was just confused why you found the zeros there if it's like greater than zero. Okay, because that's the process of solving an inequality like that. When, mm -hmm. when you have a, a greater than or less than um, 
or greater than or equal or less than or equal, so an inequality with a polynomial. The process is set it equal to zero, find those solutions and cut the real number line, and then test the intervals. Okay, so we could have done the same thing, just setting it equal to zero, and then you would have figured out after that what was positive and negative, right? Yeah, I mean, I do set it equal to zero when I find these guys zero and two. Okay. I mean, I, I didn't show that step, but that step happens when I'm solving this. So yes, you can just go straight to the, let's set it equal to zero, find the places where it equals zero, and then just check on either side. Absolutely, because that's what I did. And I do have a question too. Uh, okay. So when we're checking for the concave, we are plugging in the zero and two for the second to the second derivative, right? But when we're getting looking for inflection points, we're plugging in the number zero and two to the original function, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because if you're finding points, the points on the graph come from the function. So that's why I took zero and two and I plugged them in here. But if all we're concerned with is the concavity, concave up, concave down, we just need to look at the value of the second derivative. It, it's just like, what if I ask you to find a maximum or a minimum value? We would plug the x's into the original function, and that would give us the, the maximum and minimum values. But if I ask you, where is it increasing or decreasing? You're going to plug numbers into the first derivative and just see if it's plus or minus. So it's exactly the same idea. If you want actual points, so inflection points, you got to go to the original function. If you just want to know concavity, you're looking at the, the sign on the second derivative. All right, cool. Any other questions about this? We're, we're going to do another example, don't worry. But OK, so it seems like we're feeling pretty good. So let's do another one now whose graph we don't know. We don't know anything about. Like this one, we already knew its shape. So we could kind of cheat a little bit if we needed to. This time, let's just take a function that we have no clue about. And we're going to look for concavity and inflection points. But let's also look for increasing and decreasing and extrema. Let's just kind of do both of them at the same time. And let's use all of that information to get a good graph of this function. All right. But we're going to start easy. We're going to start with a polynomial. Mostly because polynomials are easy derivatives. <laughs> but let's do this. Let's look at f of x equaling 5 plus 3x squared minus x cubed. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to find 1. Um, where it's increasing or decreasing. We're going to find extrema if it's got them. We're also going to look at concavity. And inflection points, again, if it has any. And then we're going to see if we can draw its graph. So in terms of these different things, we're always going to be able to find places where it's increasing or decreasing. We're always going to be able to find concave up and concave down. We won't always find extrema. We've seen functions that don't have them. We also want always find inflection points. There are lots of graphs, lots of functions that don't have inflection points. OK, but we're going to check and see if they exist. If they don't exist, they don't exist. But at least we're going to see if we can find them. All right. And then again, like I said, we'll just put this all together and see if we can draw its graph. All right, so let's just start with derivatives. 
So if we get the first derivative, the first derivative of this, so the five is a constant goes away. We're left with six X minus three X squared. So there's the derivative. We also need the second derivative because that will tell us concavity and all that other good stuff. So let's take the second derivative, which is going to give us six minus six X. So we're actually done with the calculus. We're not doing any more calculus. Now this is all just going to be algebra and arithmetic. All right, so let's start with the first question. Where are we increasing and decreasing? So we need to look at the first derivative and we need to see where that's equal to zero or where it's undefined. So let's take six X minus three X squared and set it equal to zero. So we can factor out 3x. And we get x equals 0 and x equals 2. So there's where our derivative is equal to 0. Um, are there any places where this derivative is undefined? The answer is no. This this derivative is nice and easy. Plug in any number you want, it works. Um, but the reason I'm asking that is that that's another place where we can get critical points. Right? Critical points occur where the derivative is zero and where the derivative is undefined. All right. So those are our only possible extrema, um, and those are the only places where we might be changing from concave up to concave down. So let's see what that has to do or has to say. So we've got zero, we've got two. Um, again, pick numbers in between, plug them in, see what's going on. Um, if we put in a number less than zero, we're going to get a negative number. Okay, put in like negative one, you get negative nine for your derivative. So since that's negative, that tells me that the function is decreasing in that interval. Plug in one, number between zero and two. You're gonna get six minus three, which is plus three. So we know the derivative is positive in there, which means we're increasing. And then if you plug in a number bigger than two, um, you're going to get positive times a negative, which is a negative number, so it's decreasing. All right, so now we know exactly where it's increasing and where it's decreasing. It's increasing between 0 and 2, and it's decreasing other ones. All right, so we'll put a check mark on number 1 here. <laughs> We have determined where it's increasing and where it's decreasing. All right, so what about extrema? Do we have any? Of all of them. Yeah, we, we, we've actually got both. And at both of these points, zero and two, we have one or the other. So what is zero? Is it a max or a min? All right. Uh, well, who's oh, okay? I say like, chem asked. Who's that? That's Mariola. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Thanks. You you changed it on me, but that's all good. I like. It. All right. So uh, so Mariola just said that that's a min. Yeah, that's a minimum because we're going down and then we're going up. All right. So that means if we want to continue this, we've got a min. at 0, 
where that five come from? Plugging it in. Yeah, plug that zero back into the original function because I'm finding the point. So there's a local minimum at zero five. When x is equal to two, we get a maximum. So we're going to get a max. When x is equal to two, and in terms of what that y is, well, if we plug the two back into here, we're going to get five plus 12 minus eight, which I think is seven. No, how about nine? So there's a maximum, a local maximum at two nine. All right, so let's put a check mark next to the second one. We've got our extrema. So notice that the first derivative will always help us figure out if we've got uh, where we've got increasing, decreasing, and where we have extreme, right? In essence, we use the first derivative test. I don't know if you remember that first derivative test for extrema. If you go from increasing to decreasing, you've got a max. Decreasing to increasing, you've got a min. Well, that's what we did right there. All right, so now let's investigate concavity. Okay, so for concavity, we're going to take the second derivative. And we're going to see where it equals zero. Um, this one's pretty fast. There's only one place where it equals zero. All right, so this will be an easy check for us. We only have to look at on either side of one. So if we plug in a number bigger than one, like 10 or something, we're going to get a negative number. So we know that it's concave down. So it's going to be concave down from one to infinity. If we plug in a number less than one, like zero or something, we're going to get a positive number for our concavity, for our second derivative. That tells us that we're concave up. So this one goes from concave up to concave down. So it's concave up from minus infinity to one, concave down from one to infinity. All right, I'm going to put a tick mark next to concavity because we got that. All right, so what about inflection points? Are there any? Yep, there is. And, and in fact, there's just the one because there's only one place where we change concavity, but there is an inflection point. that x is one and the y, if we go back to the original function, we get five plus three minus one, which is seven. So there's an inflection point at one seven. All right, so the second derivative told us everything about concavity and inflection points. All right, now we're gonna put this all together. We're going to put this all together and see if we can get a decent graph of f of x. So I'm going to put some axes on here. And uh, I'll try to be as precise as possible. So I'll use my fingers to. Bruce, me... for... go um, ahead. For the extrema, you plugged in zero and two to f of x to see just which was bigger and which was smaller. Is that right? Nope. Not to see what's bigger and what's smaller, but to actually just find those extreme values. Because when we talk about an extreme point, the maximum is the y. Right, the maximum is it's the y value. The minimum is also the y value. 
So that's why I took zero and two and put those back into the original function because the zero just tells me where the minimum is. It doesn't tell me what the minimum is. The minimum value there is five. Okay, but you knew that they would be minimum or maximum locally? Yes, because of the increasing and decreasing bit. So zero, I'm coming down to zero. And then once I get past zero, I'm going up. So that means that's a minimum. And would you only know if that was an absolute minimum or maximum if you have an interval or can you tell from this? Um, actually I can tell, well, no. Uh, <laughs> I know it's not gonna be an absolute because this is a polynomial. Polynomials I know go on forever in some aspect, right? So because this is an odd degree polynomial, I know there's not gonna be an absolute max or an absolute min. I don't know that otherwise. But I do know that it has local min and max. So all of this, you know, when we're using the first derivative test to test these critical points, and we find out their maxes and mins, all we know for sure is that they're local. They might be absolute, right? It could turn out that they are absolute, but we don't know that until we do more work. And the only way to know that without looking at the graph is with the uh, mean value theorem, is that right? So the extreme value theorem, yeah, so if we had, the extreme value theorem, though, remember it says we're just looking on an interval from A to B. And if we did that, if instead of looking at the entirety of the real numbers, we just said, okay, we're only looking between, you know, minus three and eight or something like that, then we know from the extreme value theorem that there will be an absolute max or an absolute min, but that's because we're cutting it off. So the extreme value theorem requires us to be on a, just a finite chunk. If we're gonna allow ourselves to go forever, we don't, we're not even guaranteed that there's an absolute max or min. Okay. Could be, but we don't know. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so, uh, here are my axes, I got tick marks. Hopefully I've got enough room to draw everything, but let's see what we've got. So we've got a minimum at zero five. So I'm gonna come here to zero five. And I know that this is a min. So that means that I have to be going up in either direction from this point. There's also a maximum at two nine. So there's my two nine, and I know that that's a max. So I have to be going down on either side. Right, so think about our decreasing, increasing, decreasing. You can probably start seeing it, right? We're decreasing, then we're increasing, then we're decreasing. So that's what we already knew from last time, but now we can add on an inflection point. We know that there's an inflection point at 1, 7, which is right here. So we have another point that the graph goes through, but it also tells us a little bit more about the shape. It has to look like a cup when we're on the left of 1, and it has to look like a frown when we're to the right of 1. Okay, so this is how it's going to play out. I have to be decreasing here but looking like I'm on a cup. And then once I get to that, I have to turn over. I'm gonna see something that looks roughly like that. So here is my guess of what the graph of five plus three X squared minus X cubed looks like.
All right, so this came purely from calculus. This picture came purely from calculus. So let's see how we did. So I'm going to pull up Desmos. While I'm doing that, I will entertain any questions you guys have on me getting my graph. Anything there? Any questions on where that came from? All right, so hearing none, seeing none. Let me go ahead and share my screen, and we'll go graph this thing on Desmos. All right, so we had five plus three x squared minus x cubed. So let me just shift this a little bit so we can actually see it. How do we do? Pretty good. I'd say pretty darn good, right? Like even you can see the points here, it's going through zero five, there's our minimum. It's going through one seven, which was an inflection point. We had the point two nine, which was a maximum. And hopefully you can see all of the features that we found using calculus. Decreasing, increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down. Um, now, the intercept, the actual intercept for this graph is around 3.4. And I don't know if you can actually see on my graph, since it's kind of small right now. Uh, mine looked like it was more going through around four, but uh, not terrible, right, in terms of at least a rough guess. Um, obviously, I could have done a little bit better if I had found intercepts and things like that. Um, but for just a rudimentary graph of just using what calculus told me, I did a pretty good job, right? And I say that I did a good job, but it's more like we did a good job. We just took the information that we were given from calculus and we got that picture. All right, so hopefully you're starting to see the power of calculus, at least when it comes to graphing things. Um, it makes it so that we don't actually have to use technology. We can just use calculus to get it. All right, so this is the general process, no matter what the function is. Differentiate, use that to find increasing, decreasing, and extrema. Differentiate again, to find concavity and inflection points, and then you can kind of piece it all together. All right, um, I do want to mention, though, that there is a second test for extrema called the second derivative test. I already showed you the first derivative test. Let me show you the second derivative test. Um, and I'm going to kind of keep this up on board here a little bit so we can reference it. But this is the second derivative test for extrema. So remember that the first derivative test told us whether we had a max or a min by looking at increasing or decreasing, right? We look at on either side, see if there was a change um, from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Well, the second derivative test uses the second derivative to tell you whether or not um, the point, the critical point is a max or a min, all right? So first of all, to use the second derivative test, we need f of x to be twice differentiable. It's exactly what it sounds like. It needs to be a function that you can find a second derivative for. That sort of seems like a duh. If it's a second derivative test where we're going to use the second derivative, we better be able to find the second derivative. Okay, but math lawyers got to make sure we got all our 
our ducks in a row. So we need f of x to be twice differentiable, okay? But then this is what, uh, how this plays out, okay? If f prime of x, or how about if f prime of c equals zero, x equals c gives a maximum if f double prime of c is less than zero and gives a minimum if f double prime of c is greater than zero. So there's your second derivative test. All right, so basically we're looking at the critical points where the derivative was zero. If the derivative was undefined, it was one of those critical points, you can't use the second derivative test. You have to use the first derivative test. But in the case where you're getting a critical point where the derivative is equal to zero, you just have to look at the sign of the second derivative. Is it positive or is it negative? If it's positive, then it's going to be a minimum. And if it's negative, then it's going to be a maximum. OK, I know that doesn't feel right. That, wait a minute, if this thing is negative, why are we getting a max? Because maximum, we usually think, you know, it's like positive, big, whatever. It seems backwards. But think about what this is doing. If the second derivative is negative, it means we're concave down. All right, so think about this graph where we were concave down. We were concave down in here. And you can imagine if we're on a frown, if we're on a part of a graph where we're on a frown, and we get a derivative of zero, so a horizontal tangent line, the only place that that's going to happen is if we're at a maximum. And then similarly, if we're concave up, so is this part over here on the left. So we're on a cup shape or a smile shape. The only place that we're going to get a zero derivative, a flat horizontal tangent line, is going to be when we're at a minimum. All right, so this is just how this plays out. If you're concave up, you're at a minimum. If you're concave down, you're at a maximum. All right, so the second derivative test, take it for what it is. It's another way of determining whether or not your extreme value is a max or a min. All right, do you need the second derivative test? No, you can just use the first derivative. However, you can use the second derivative and it's kind of fast. So let's come back to this guy real quick. So we saw that the derivative was um, 6x minus 3x squared. And we saw that the second derivative was 6 minus 6x. From the first derivative, we found critical points of 0 and 2. OK, well, here's how easy this would be. If you did f double prime of 0, that gives you 6. So since it's positive, it's concave up, which means that extreme point is a minimum. Done. Similarly, if you were to plug in the 2, you get negative 6. So now we're concave down. Right, and if we're concave down, that means our extreme or uh, critical point is the max. So notice I wrote a max at x equal to, not a maximum of x equals two. That just tells me where it is. If I want to know what the max and min values are, I still got to go back and plug them in. But I was able to determine that it was a max or a min fast. 
because I have the second derivative. So um, I'm actually a big fan of the second derivative test, mostly because I only have to plug in one number. For the first derivative test, I got to plug in two numbers. I got to plug in a number smaller and bigger to see if there's a change. Um, second derivative test, I just got to plug in one number. Yeah, but I had to take the derivative of the derivative, so there was some work involved. Um, but I would prefer to take derivatives than plug in numbers and do arithmetic, because right? I'm a little bit weird, I'm sure. Um, but now I, I just find calculus is easier than trying to do calculations, especially if the numbers I'm plugging in are like fractions and, and whatnot. Anyway, so just realize that now there's a second derivative test to go along with the first derivative test for um, determining what kind of extreme values you have. And um, you don't need both of them, really. You don't. It's just, it's another nice tool to have. All right, so uh, we're starting to be able to do pretty good graphs, even with just the calculus. So what we're going to do on Wednesday, because we're not having class on Monday, but what we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to kind of develop one more thing. We're going to look at what happens when we take limits as we go to infinity. We've never talked about those, but we're going to talk about infinite limits. And then we're going to use that in addition to these first and second derivative tests to get spot on graphs of functions. And um, hopefully you will continue to be impressed with how good and how accurate our graphs can be using nothing but this computer right here. All right. So um, with that, everybody have an awesome extended weekend. And I will see you all on Wednesday.